Welcome to the Mile High Podcast. This is your host, Dr. Daniel Knowles. Thank you for joining us and reminder to hit subscribe so you never miss any Mile High tick. Today, I am super thrilled to get to introduce and be in conversation, be in dialogue with Dr. Robert Debonis. He is one of the elder statesmen in chiropractic that you need to learn more from and learn more about. And uh, this is going to be a very um, eye-opening, enlightening interview. And, you know, I'll tell you, there's really not enough appreciation in chiropractic of wisdom that people have to share from their experience in chiropractic. I'm, I'm learning that at my young age. So, uh, Bob, thank you so yes. much for joining us. Well, thank you for the invitation. I, I look forward to sharing whatever little bit of wisdom I might have. I think you have more than a little bit. So let's start with this. Let people get to know you. Can you share a little bit about how you found your way in chiropractic? 1954, I got my first adjustment at the age of four years old. Not because my parents embraced the philosophy and understanding of chiropractic, but because my father was a truck driver, had a bad back, suffered tremendously, um, Finally, two of his coworkers dragged him into a chiropractor in the Bronx and he got adjusted and came back standing up straight without pain. That had an amazing imprint on me. It influenced me. My mother was diagnosed with uh, rheumatoid arthritis and she suffered tremendously. And in an offhanded conversation with the chiropractor, my dad asked, is there anything you can do for my wife? And the chiropractor, who was not vitalistic at all, um, basically said, well, we don't cure rheumatoid arthritis, but maybe we can get her body to work a little bit better. So at the age of four, off I went with her and my sister, and we went as a family to this chiropractor. Initially, the kids did not get adjusted, but he had this high-low table. And at four, I thought that was the coolest thing. I wanted to ride on the table. So he also had three kids that got adjusted. And in the course of going for a, a number of months, I finally got to get on the, uh, the table and I got my first adjustment. For many years, our family went to see him, but basically for musculoskeletal pain, he never, mentioned anything about innate intelligence, about the power of the body to heal. He was basically what we would call a mixer. And he was a very good chiropractor, great adjuster. Um, and for some reason, he saw something in me. And from a very early age, he would promote chiropractic as a career for me. He said, you make a great chiropractor. Why don't you be a chiropractor? Now, my history is that I was a swimmer in, um, well, from when I was 11, competitive swimming, springboard diving, one meter, three meter. And um, I would rack myself up all the time doing these dives. And um, I would go up to the Bronx and get adjusted. And he would adjust me and he would say, why don't you be a chiropractor? Now, to his credit, um, I still felt, although I had had amazing personal results and would testify to the value of chiropractic at a very early age, I still thought they were quacks. <laughs> so when he would say to me, why don't you be a chiropractor? I, I would literally say to him, well, I think I could do better than being a second rate doctor. <laughs> <laughs> now, to his credit and my shame, uh, he, never, he never threw me out. So uh, I went to college, got a degree, was in a master's program. Um, that career path seemed to be closing down on me. Um, and I looked for another option. 
I went to the library. There was a thick reference book called the Occupational Index. And in that federal publication, there was the word chiropractor. And all of a sudden I thought, oh, this is legitimate. <laughs> so I went back to his office. He told me that he was the, the dean in the past of the Columbia Institute of Chiropractic, the precursor to New York Chiropractic. Uh -huh. So I asked him, well, what are the requirements? Do I have to take an entrance exam, med cat? So he said, you're alive, you're breathing. Um, you, you have biology, chemistry, you took some science courses. I said, yeah. He said, I'll sign your application and you're in. Having done all of this, I still was very, very skeptical. I was married at the time. I said to my wife, if this is a bunch of smoke and mirrors and I really don't believe in it, I'll find something else to do. Mm -hmm. So off I went on a trial basis to take one trimester of chiropractic. And much to my blessing, I went to school with the children, grandchildren, uh, spouses of chiropractors. And they start telling these phenomenal stories about, no, I never had uh, the mumps, the measles, the chicken pox, don't have a cavity. Well, uh, been adjusted since I was born. And I would say, what does that have to do with a bad back? You know, what, what does it have to do with neck pain? And slowly through field doctors that I would go into their offices and seek questions because I was so skeptical, um, I got the big idea. And in truth, it was my first lay lecture that I drove from Brooklyn to Ken Harris's office in Waldwick, New Jersey where I finally heard the story, as we used to say, the chiropractic story, the concept of chiropractic, and the light went on, for which I am indebted to Ken Harris forever. And, um, you know, I became a real uh, philosophical, straight, uh, upper cervical um, chiropractor, adjusting through clinic that way, went down to DE from New York dozens and dozens of times, with a mission to have everyone in my class attend at least one DEA. We would drive 19 hours through the night simply to hear the philosophy of chiropractic because we really weren't getting it later on in, uh, in our educational experience. Mm -hmm. Well, that's my background. I started out skeptical. I started out as a kid. I had positive results and uh, took on a way of life. Well, I've got to say something. I want to bring some connections, some personal connections to this, because this was a chiropractor in the Bronx, right? It was your first, your father, and then you, yes. right? Uh, do you remember their name? Harry Hughes, H-U-D-E-S. I don't, I don't know him. Um, I first was brought to a chiropractor in the Bronx that my mom yeah. brought to, that just randomly was in our neighborhood, neighborhood to get care. And Columbia Institute, my, my mom graduated from, from NYCC because it had changed. And I heard, I went to this chiropractor in the Bronx because I had allergies. My mom brought me to them. We had never been, no one had been to a chiropractor before. And long story short, not to be a surprise to anybody listening to this podcast, the allergies went away and the rest is history. She became, my mom went to chiropractic school. And then uh, here's the part that I want to make the connection. My first chiropractic lay lecture, I heard as part of family night at NYCC when they brought all the families of the students. And it was, I heard it, my first chiropractic le lay lecture from uh, DiGiacomo. Wow. Yeah, he was definitely one of the influencers. Tom Whitehorn, mm -hmm. uh, another one that I share with Donnie, uh, had a real influence on me, teaching me upper cervical work. So yes. we went above and beyond to get what we needed. Right, right. So, and, and I think at that time, Columbia, and then the early parts of NYCC was a, was a very, um, yes, a philosophical school, but really a powerhouse of a school in terms of the, what, you know, the, the vitalistic uh, education? Well, you know, I think that the students uh, really, our peer group was the thing that really taught us. You know, like when you go to seminars, um, 
you listen to the speakers, but where you really learn is in the hallway, yes. uh, talking it, talking it down. Yeah. Um, so uh, no doubt the faculty that we had was outstanding, uh, had a, a really wonderful understanding of the concept of chiropractic. The school was really, from an administrative point of view, not supportive of all of that. Right. Um, there tra- was the transition that happened, but there was the, the history yeah. of Columbia, right. Columbia had the history of being more philosophical. Right. As, right. as they got a- accreditation and they had to ju- jump through CCE and all of those things, uh, the program drastically changed. Such as history of so many schools, and as, as, we, as we know. And so... Here's the thing that I'd like to ask with that, to build on that. Um, I use the term um, elder statesman. And he, I, I don't wanna talk, I wanna start the conversation is that so much of chiropractic, um, there's so much wisdom in the generations of chiropractors that I feel is, I'm afraid that it's getting lost that's not getting passed, um, that people are newer students, newer graduates, not to any fault of theirs, are somehow missing some of the artistry and the passion of the philosophy. Um, how do we shift that? Well, the way I describe what you just said, and it's something that I've observed as well, is I was lucky enough to to learn chiropractic from the first generation. Uh What I mean by that is you had BJ. My instructors had BJ as instructors, those that went to Palmer. Or they had, their teachers were really, you know, the ones that were opened and in practice without a license that were um, $3 an adjustment, knock on the door, open up, hello, who are you, who sent you? Uh, waiting to go to jail. So they had a real commitment to chiropractic. And those are the people that I learned from. I'm old enough to remember something called a mimeograph machine or a photo, a photo stat. So I got a first generation copy. I got, I got the clear photo stat of the original, but then it goes to the next copy of a copy then a copy of a copy of a copy. And, and that's what I think we're seeing is that yeah. we, we need to go back and find the original and, and learn from that. And Love it. many of us that have been in practice for over 40 years, um, we, we had that exposure. We, we learned from, from the, the, the kids that sat at the feet of the founder and yes. the developer. So I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. What I am encouraged about is that I've gone on a number of mission trips all around the world. And some of the students that are committed to chiropractic, who put their hand in their pocket to pay their way and go the extra yard, they are still out there. Mm -hmm. They are holding up the torch. They're great adjusters. They understand the philosophy and they're getting amazing amounts of experience Mm-hmm. So if I could say anything to students that might be tuned in and listening, it's if you have the opportunity to go on one of those mission trips through any of the schools, I strongly suggest you do it. You will see miracles. You will see people that are so sick that you'd never see in your office when you practice in the United States. And you'll see the power of, and I say this only, the adjustment, mm-hmm. just an adjustment the difference it can make in a life. Mm-hmm. And I think that's very powerful. And, and there's something about that. I've heard this said often. I don't know if you've said this or thought this, um, but that first generation of chiropractors and even a little bit after that, um, they witnessed miracles now we we still do. However, they had a, they had a higher level of conviction of that miracles were going to happen versus being taught that oh chiropractic is a physical therapeutic service for neck and back pain, like right. they expected miracles. Yeah, your your expectations, your intent 
no matter what technique you use, is, is I think a critical part to the healing process that when you walk into that room, it's you and a patient and you better know that you know that you know how to deliver the goods of an adjustment that that person is literally longing for. Um, and if you only do that, you will change that life in immeasurable ways. Right. You don't, right. you don't need anything else. Chiropractic can stand on its own. Um, you know, I, I've had the opportunity to practice in just about every type of clinical setting you can imagine. I've been a solo practitioner, I was a partner, I've had associates, I was an associate, I've worked in a medical facility down here. And the other side of chiropractic wants this acceptance. They, they wanna belong to the team. And whenever I get the chance, I tell those brothers, cousins of ours that if you wanna be a good team player, you have to play your position. Right, right. Nobody right. wants a first baseman that's gonna run out into right field after a pop fly. Nobody right. wants a hog um, on a team trying to do all things to all patients. Right. So just delivering chiropractic, a unique, unduplicated, special, special service, I practiced in Manhattan for almost 30 years. I moved to the Virgin Islands, not because I wanted to retire, but I had this dream that there would be an oasis, an island, a paradise, subluxation free. Mm -hmm. You know, you get off the ferry, you have to go to a substation and get cleared before you're allowed on the island. Um, and I practiced down here for an, another 15 years. So, uh, my point is that you can have the lifestyle that you want, whether it's big city and uh, crazy mass, huge practice or a small country island practice. You can have it any way you want in just delivering an adjustment. And this is an important area, which is that chiropractic, that the adjustment is unique, is non-duplicating, that it's separate, it's distinct. Can you speak to that? Why it's important that the chiropractic adjustment is unique, distinct, a separate service than anything done by other healthcare professionals relative to the spine and okay. nerve system? You know, I've gone to China four times I've told the chiropractic story, the concept of chiropractic to hundreds of millions of people through Alibaba. Ah. And, and what, I, what I tell the Chinese, which is very simple, is that chiropractors understand that within the body there dwells an energy, an intelligence. And they go, ah, yes, they understand that. That that intelligence uses the brain, the nerve system, the spinal cord as a communication system to tell the body what to do and how to function. And they go, yes, of course. That chiropractors understand that true health is when all the parts of the body are working correctly. And that is called 100% health, appropriate function, mm -hmm. not sickness and disease treatment. Mm -hmm. You go, yes, chiropractors are the only professionals that are trained to find nerve blockages, to address subluxation, where there's an interference to that communication that's not allowing that power to run your body the way it's supposed to. They get the message. And then I say, would anyone like to get their spine checked? And they line up. Now, I know that they understand the concept even beyond that because they hand me their babies. And I ask them, what's wrong with the baby? And they say nothing, but shouldn't their spine be checked? The power of reuniting the infinite knowledge of the universe expressed within that individual, closing the gap. The Sistine Chapel has that great, you know, 
painting on it where you have God and you have Adam. And that we're right in the gap. That's where we live. And making that connection is the thing that keeps me passionate and excited about chiropractic. 40 years plus. If I was just moving bones and people say, oh, thanks, my back feels so much better. I would have stopped doing this years ago. I made a great living. I have a wonderful life. And I would have said, okay, I'm done. But I still get excited when a baby comes in, I adjust the baby. Mother calls me up and says, the baby had four bowel movements. Oh, the baby was constipated for eight days. And students will ask me, oh, which vertebrae did you adjust? Which one was the magic right, one that right, the kids right. a crap? And no, it's reuniting the, the spiritual and the physical. And if you understand the why of what you're doing, that will give you such courage to just walk into any place under any circumstances on an airplane at 30,000, 38,000 feet in the air and give a person an adjustment if that's what they need. Mm -hmm. yeah. Go into a hospital, go anywhere. Nobody can do what you can do. Right, right. Now with that, in my experience right now, so many students, recent date DC graduates, a high percentage of them are learning chiropractic, um, getting a DC degree and learning it as some kind of glorified physical therapeutics. How do we, what do we need to do to help change that trajectory? Well, all of us have to be ultra successful. We have to show, like when I, when I practiced in Manhattan, I had a nice fancy car. I would go up to the projects in Harlem and adjust people and kids would look me and watch me drive up and they'd say, wow, he's not a drug dealer. He's, he's a chiropractor. So first of all, you, you owe it to your profession to be successful at it. There's no reason for you to struggle. And if that means high volume practice for you, great. If that means charging $400 for an adjustment, it's worth it. I, I had the philosophy of just making my, my practice affordable and I wanted to see as many people as possible and I never turned anybody away and I was always rewarded. So number one is you got to get your head screwed on straight and be successful. Why? So that you're a guiding light. So that other people look at you and say, oh, you mean I, I don't have to do all of these other things? I can spend four minutes with a, with a patient, have them come back and have them understand the value of the service that I'm rendering them, that I don't have to go through this prolonged nutritional exercise, physiology, physical therapy model. No, send them to other people to do that or better yet, incorporate it into your own corporation and have this full staff of wellness people. Um, the medical facility that I practiced in, I was the chiropractor. There was a medical, well, actually were four medical doctors, nurse practitioners, a midwife, a nutritionist. And what did I do? I adjusted patients. The guy came in who was 260 pounds. I said, you got to deal with your nutrition. You got to deal with your weight. I could keep adjusting you, but you got other issues. That's not my job. Let them spend two hours with them trying to get them on a diet. Is it important for their health? Yes. I would tell students, you know, I had a, a truck driver that came in and he would bounce around in his truck. He would throw his pelvis out. I would adjust him. Then he'd go back to work. He would throw his pelvis out. Did I go out in the street and change the shock absorbers in his truck? because that was the underlying contributing factor to his subluxation? No. There are things that people need that you cannot, should not limit yourself to giving an adjustment. You'll do great. That's a message that we have to share with young practitioners who get desperate. I had no qualms about going on the subway in New York, handing out chiropractic literature serving chiropractic, not to build my practice because I had the sense that people were dying in want of an adjustment and it was my responsibility. 
Beautiful. Wow. And and that's the that's the fire that I came out of school with myself. And I get concerned about the future of chiropractic. Where do you want to see chiropractic go? Well, first of all, <clears throat> I, I'm really concerned about the lack of unity in our profession. I'm, I'm really concerned about our vitalistic camp. I'm really concerned that there's an attitude of, I'm straighter than you. I'm the straightest of the straightest. I don't care about out outcomes. I adjusted the atlas. If the patient died, then they're unified with their spiritual aspect. You have to be realistic. Did I ever take care of people with symptoms? Yes. Did I try to educate them to a better way of life? Yes. Did they all accept it? Absolutely not. I considered myself a failure if I didn't get through to them. Did I have families that saw me for 30 years? Yes. Their children, their children's children, their grandchildren, absolutely. It's a small percentage of it, though. Right, right. And we need more of them. And we need more of them, for sure. All of us do. And uh, I remember reading um, in Chiropractic Thoughts with J.R. Drain, Drain talking about there's going to be X number of generations of chiropractors to, to have a chiropractic planet. And we're, we've got a long way to go. So there's a, 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 big, a big mission there. Um, well, I, you know, I see a global mission. And, right. and so that's why I get discouraged when I see us circling the wagons and firing in at each other. You know, like I mentioned at the beginning, the chiropractor that I went to, he had no philosophy at all. He was a mechanic. He, he was an x-ray technician that wanted to be a doctor. So he became a chiropractor. Right. But he still was exposed to the philosophy. And I would go back to him and he'd say, don't pay too much attention to that philosophy stuff. Learn how to adjust. Mm -hmm. He was a mechanic. Mm -hmm. And for me, learning the why was the foundation on which I built the art and the science. Mm -hmm. You have to have that triangle and it has to be balanced. Absolutely. So I'm going to China. I'm going to Tonga with Life West. We introduced Tonga, a small island with giant rugby players to chiropractic. So miracles happen. Um, I've gone to India, um, seen 10 thousand people in three days get adjusted. I'll just tell you a quick story. When I was in India in January, these two guys bring in a guy who's in a coma. Has that ever happened in your office in the US? Someone comes in unconscious. I adjusted his atlas, his eyes opened up. Had him come back in the afternoon. When his eyes opened up, he wasn't there. You know what I mean? It was just this blank stare. Adjusted him a second time, somebody was home. He started to relate to what was going on around him. His wife is in tears, she's crying. The next day I adjusted him, he could sit up. He started to talk. Then that afternoon I adjusted him and he started to walk. He had been unconscious in a coma for six months. Wow. You are not gonna see that in the United States anywhere. Nobody's going to bring the ambulance to your office. But the power of the adjustment, the ramifications, the far reaching effects on that family, the mother was telling me that now her two younger kids could go to school again, because they had to stay home with their father. And she was going out trying to find money for the family. Right. The rippling effect. Amazing. And it just continues so far. Um, and that's another area, which is actually, before I ask this next question, can you say something about, uh, and I didn't know we were going to go in this direction. Um, can you say any, anything about where people can find an opportunity to be in a, uh, on one of these types of mission trips? I'm sorry, I missed what you said. How to can hook you, up with that? How, how you, can you say anything about how people can find being on one of these mission trips, or do you have a particular one that you recommend, or or where can they start looking if they're if they're inspired? Um, 
You know, uh, Peter Morgan yes. has a, a mission trip and an orphanage down in Haiti. Um, Life Chiropractic West, Sherman, uh, they go to Panama. They go. Uh, my son and I, when he was in school, we went to El Salvador. Um, you know, you know, they're out there. I, I would just contact any of the schools. Uh, Life University has them. Um, yeah, just know how to adjust and and put your hands on as many people as you can. The world is dying for what we have to offer. And so that, and then that's the next thing I wanted to bring to. So let's encourage people to hook up with school, hook up with some of the people that do uh, mission trips and how, talk about the, the big picture, the big idea of this being a chiropractic world, the world needing chiropractic of that, of that changing from just a handful to a majority. What, what do you envision with that? I'm very optimistic. Okay. But I am also very realistic. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't sure I was gonna go in this direction, but one of the things that I did with my career um, was I got involved in the profession and through no desire on my own, I was on the New York State Board of Examiners. Mm. I did that for 15 years. And many wow. times I was, wow. I was the, the lone voice. I was the chairman for two years. And many times I was the only one in the room who had a philosophical understanding of chiropractic. Actually the public member and the medical doctor had a greater understanding of what chiropractic could and I've seen, that to be, I've seen that to be the case before, sadly. Well, now I'm the chairman of the, new, uh, of the Virgin Islands uh, Chiropractic Board of Examiners. And I've been on that board for uh, six years. So first, and you know, I, I would say that everybody, you know, it, it's easy to preach to the choir. It's easier, it's easy to go to a seminar and say how great chiropractic is to an audience who is, um, preaching to the choir, going to your state association, the other guys, uh -huh. and reaching out to them, getting on a board of examiners and being a pure drop of water in the polluted mud puddle, um, making the sacrifices, uh, getting out of your office. Uh, you know, I had a great practice. I took care of wonderful people, but I felt a commitment, a responsibility to get involved in these things. Go to FCLB, go to CCE, go to NBCE, become a player there. And pretty soon you're rubbing elbows against other well-intentioned committed chiropractors who just have a different view of where they wanna see chiropractic go. They're looking through the keyhole when we have cinemascopic huge screen in front of us. <laughs> If yeah. I was a young student, if it was 40 years ago and I was starting, I'd go to China. Right. It'd be a, a huge success. There's no barrier there. They've tried Western medicine since the 1970s and they're going back to more traditional Chinese medicine because they don't want to be surgery, you know, undergo surgery. They don't want drugs and medication. Uh, they want to maintain a healthy lifestyle. Right, right. There's places in the world where, you know, you could be ultra successful, be the only chiropractor and have chiropractic defined on your own terms. Right, right, absolutely. A big vision, a big idea, mm -hmm. not in competition with the guy across the street or, or how am I gonna get 10 new patients this week into my office when, when there's thousands of people who want what you have and are looking for you Right, right, right. And that's so important. I would even go to say even more important than ever with the current circumstances that we've had this past little over a year. So, um, and it brings to the surface how important increasing your skill sets around the art of chiropractic and increasing that mastery is, is important. Um, 
Hmm. Danny, you want to fight over whether or not you should wear a mask? <laughs> Do you want to fight with a patient as to whether or not they should get a vaccine or not? Right. It's not chiropractic. Right. Tell them, stay healthy, stay strong. You won't have to be fearful. Right. Tell them right. about 1917 and the sanitariums that were there and that the, the, the Spanish flu was killing people in the millions, but chiropractic patients didn't die. That that's the reason that it was the first boost in our history as to how chiropractic became prominent. People want preventative care. They want to stay well. Well, and I, I've been serving people through this. I will tell you, that was my big lesson to have a palpable experience of that and how much people value getting care for just the health of it, just being at their best, just to have that, that this was part of optimizing their life. That, that really rose up tremendously. I think, I think we're at a critical point, a boiling point, a turning point where chiropractors going through this last year, we saw offices close because they didn't have the right messaging. They didn't understand what they had to offer. Yet we saw other offices that were booming. People were coming in on a more regular basis because they didn't want to get sick. They wanted to enhance their immune system. Right. They wanted to stay healthy. They knew that their natural body had the best chance of fighting off anything. Right. Right. That is a moment that we're losing and we're not getting our message out there that chiropractic saves lives. It lets your body work better. We've we've developed an immune system over hundreds of thousands of years that knows how to deal in balance. Don't kill the virus. Learn to live with it. That's what our ancestors did with the Black Plague. Right. We are the survivors of that. They right. didn't have anything to offer back then. They said, wear a mask, stay isolated, and hopefully it won't catch you. Well, you're going to be exposed to it. Give your body the best chance it can to fighting it off naturally. Right. Right. Absolutely. And that's so, the message we should be screaming from the mountaintops. And that's what I've been thinking. You know, that's the that's that's the issue now. To, very much so. And that's where, um, you know, rather than f fight about that, just help the people have the internal capacity by their body being at its best, you know, doing what we do best. So I want to say something, ask you one last question. Um, and again, it was so great to have you, the elders at Mile High past year. Um, I, I was 2018 or 2019, it was phenomenal. Um, can, can you close this by saying something um, about the elders and uh, the, that, that organization? Well, it, it, you know, the elders started out as a bunch of us sitting around on a Zoom call or actually in person. And we share stories. It's like when you get, you know, to um, a, a bunch of chiropractors. So I had this patient and this happened and that happened, the other thing. And we came up with the idea like students need to hear this information about these little offhanded conversations that we have. Like, how did you get to see 100 patients a week? Uh, how did you break through all of that? Um, how did you start your practice? How did you, you know, what were the tools that you used? Um, and we thought we have this information to share. So we started this elder council. And for almost two years, we would call once a month, all Zoom in. We recorded some of those. Um, people came onto the council, went off the council. Uh, it got redirected. We spoke at Mile High, um, and it was really well received. We enjoyed doing it. We look forward, by the way, of getting out there and coming back again if we can make that happen. Um, when is the next Mile High scheduled for? October now? September. September. We decided to do it September so to have the 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 best access for everybody. Well, I I encourage you to reach out to uh, Ken Harris and and get us on the program. Uh, we're, we're more than happy to share. And, and I appreciate so much there being the wisdom of wisdom being passed down because our culture needs that um, and chiropractic needs that so much so. 
So, well, you, you know, uh, let me just say that. Yeah, please. The elders don't all get along together. We, we have different opinions, but in an audience listening to us go back and forth or sharing, well, this is the way I did it. This was my truth. This was how it worked for me. Well, that's gonna resonate with somebody in the audience. Right. But then, but then Jay or Ken would say something and they'll say, oh, well, wait a minute, that resonates with, yeah, I, I don't have the, the chutzpah. I don't have the balls to go stand on a street corner and hand out business cards. I, that's not my style. I can't, well, I did that, but it doesn't mean it's the right thing for you. Mm -hmm. Speak wherever you can or you know, get out into the community, mm -hmm. uh, go take doctors to lunch. We, you know, we all had different avenues. We all practiced differently, but we all shared the understanding of the art, the science and the philosophy of chiropractic. So when we get together and we share these things, hey, listen, this is just the way I did it. It might work for you. It, it's no cookie cutter. This is the way you got to do it. You got to say this on a, a visit number three and then say this on visit number six and be scripted this way. That, that's not the way it works. You come from your heart. You love people. You let them know you love them and you'll be successful. And that's what the elders is about. Yes. Helping you to be as success as possible so you could be a shining light so that the guy down the street says, I don't know what you're doing, but your office is packed and full and I'm having trouble keeping my office open. And, and um, connecting people to the foundational values, principles that are our, our heritage and our future at the same time. So um, yes. And so I want to thank you for taking that time for being with us today in this podcast. Um, and I really appreciate truly all that you've done for chiropractic, more importantly, all that you've done for humanity over, over the decades. Um, so thank you for taking time to be on the podcast and thank you for touching lives and thank you for also, um, uh, the, the whole elder organization as well. So everyone, we look forward to seeing you in September. See you in September. <laughs> look forward to seeing you in September, September 23rd to 25th, um, 2021, milehighchiroregistration.com. More importantly, keep changing spines and lives and minds with chiropractic. And we will make the world a better place. Thank you.